be amazed at how it just falls off of you over time. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's your finances. I don't care if it's your marriage. I don't care if it's if it, well, I don't care if it's your relationships. It does not matter. Just keep showing up. If you're sick, just keep showing up. Don't stop. Just keep showing up because here's where you get your healing. This is where this is where the spirit is. You don't get this stuff out in the world all the time. I, I don't get this at my office every day. This is why we come here. Just keep showing up. Don't stop showing up. Just keep coming. Just keep coming. You told me seven, eight years ago when I was dealing with baloney. 18 months, just keep showing up. It'll, it'll fall off of you. Just keep coming. Just keep showing up. This is why we do it. Because this is where victory is. This is where victory is. Amen? Yes, it is. This is where we learn our righteousness. This is where we learn how much the Father loves us. It's in here. It's not always out there. Just keep showing up. Just keep showing up. This is where the victory is. Amen? Somebody shout amen. That's the word of the Lord to you today. You know, it's not complicated, is it? What did Jesus say? His, his yoke would be easy. His burden would be light. It's not hard. It's easy. Say this, I go to church on the Word. I don't stay home from church on the Word. <laughs> what was that that girl showed up at Walmart? I run into people all the time that I used to pastor. I can't remember who they are. Oh, there's Pastor John. Run up and hug me. I just hug him back. Sometimes I wouldn't. Now, if that had been Deborah, I'd have known Deborah. But what, I had this thing come out of my mouth. I, I started to say, what church are y'all going to now? What came out of me was, y'all staying home from what church now? <laughs> I didn't mean to be ugly. <clears throat> you know, it don't matter what church, it don't matter how bad the church is. And it don't matter how good it is. It'll be of no significance to you if you stay home from it. <laughs> well, you didn't stay home from it. You came yes. to church this morning. Now, this morning, this morning I had the word of the Lord come to me while I woke up. He, it's like he was standing there waiting on me to wake up and then he said something to me. I saw this. He said, now, son of man, if Deborah shows up for church, then you bring her and sit her on the front row. <laughs> Some of gun. Uh huh. Well, if you son of a gun, that means you're Pappy's a pistol. I know. I don't obey you. Sit I obey him. Now point your finger at her and start speaking blessings to her. Call her. Tell her what she is. The righteousness of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Delivered. Full of preach. Full of light. Full of life, full of wholeness, full of blessing, full of victory. Can't fail for winning. In the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> full of strength, a light in dark places. Full of grace and mercy for people. Say wisdom again. Wisdom. Everybody call wisdom. Tell her, tell her how wise she is. He said, if Deborah shows up for church now, you sit her up here. If Deborah shows up, at the time, at the time, you can be mad at me all you want to. I don't obey you. I obey him. <laughs> now, now. He said, now, give her a piece of money. No, see, I don't obey you either. <laughs> give her a piece of money. Now, you girls, look in, look in your purse and see if there's a piece or on you is a piece of jewelry or something you can give her. Give her a, some earrings or something, just a little piece of jewelry that maybe even be on your body that you'd be willing to part with. 
sew some jewelry into her. We're going to deck her and adorn her today. Just give her something. That's what they did to uh, Job. They gave him a piece of money and gave him each one an earring of gold. We're going to deck her and adorn her. Give, just give her some money. I know you feel like you're on the spot. That's okay. You're on the spot. Well, they don't need to, but I, I told them to, and they're going to. Good word. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> and it don't matter if it's costume jewelry or what it is. There you go. Just help the girl out. Anybody got a stick of lipstick or something you want to give her? Anything like that. Look at, look at this. Look at this. You can't beat love, can you? How do you, you can't beat that? Look at that. <laughs> uh huh. Look at that. And that sweet. These girls love on each other. That's sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> Good girl. Mm -hmm. It's just her turn. See, if you can't receive from men, how are, you, how are you going to receive from God? He's trying to give to you. So you just give of what you do have. And he'll bless you. <laughs> okay, you can sit there right there. <laughs> there you go. Isn't that sweet and that pretty? Oh, that baby. Isn't that sweet? Sweet, good. There you go. Isn't that so sweet? Sweet. Y'all are so funny. Oh, she, she said, she said, give me that, ear, that necklace. <laughs> hey, when you get in receive mode, go ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. There you go. There you go. Very good. That's what it takes. All right, now. I heard somebody say, never have we seen it on this wise. Oh, you pawned all your jewelry? To pay for Richard's medicine. Oh, she pawned all her jewelry to pay for Richard's medicine. <laughs> well, he ain't gonna let her go without jewelry. <laughs> Did you know jewelry is scriptural? Now, there's some church denominations that think you ought not wear. If you do, you're going to hell. And here we're giving it out to people. <laughs> the Bible says that they decked and they adorned themselves with jewelry. Whenever uh, David went to Ziklag that time and took, and, and took out all those people, remember, that had come and taken from him, he took all the spoil out of all their tents and took all their jewelry and decked themselves with all the jewelry of the enemy. God believes in adorning you, make you pretty. Okay. All right, I'm not going to embarrass you much longer. You just hug me. <laughs> Thank you.
I just had this wave of thanksgiving hit me. Mm. Thankful I'm a pastor. Sometimes I wish he'd call somebody else. <laughs> but he didn't. That usually don't last long. You get days like this, it's payday in my mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's lasting longer than you think. I know it. You can get on your feet, though. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't if I can remember. <laughs> yeah, because where I am right now, I don't have any love. I mean that. Why don't you stand up and hug him? <laughs> Some of you newcomers would have to have had the history with us to understand what's going on here today. All these men were her husband's best friends. He was my servant. <laughs> Now see, now Tony just came up, so this is a hug from Richard. You see, he's, he, he's obeying the leading of the Spirit. He's doing this by the Spirit. See, we get in too big a hurry in church to do the next thing, do the next thing, do the next thing. Let's don't get in a hurry. Now see, what you're seeing here too is the Bible says that God will plead the cause of the widow. That's what he's doing here today. He's pleading the cause of the widow. You see? If we'd gotten a big hurry, it might would have cost her some money. Turn. Next, and here comes another. Richard oversaw the biker group here at Church on the Word, so we got bikers hugging her. I think this is the Sunday we call the biker group back into operation. Come on. <clears throat> You'll ride safe. Yeah, come on. Come on, bikers. Yeah, come on, you motorcyclers, come on. All you bikers, come on back up here. It was a light, that, that ministry is a light and an outreach. It's a good fellowship. You'll ride safe. Come on up. <laughs> oh, y'all, it's a good day in church. Mm -mm. Good day in church. Yeah, just come up here for a little bit. Good day. It's a good day in church.
Y'all come on up here and just line up. Get up here around her. Crowd in around her real close. Come, just get in around her close. There you go. There you go. Come on. I mean, yeah, one of it. <laughs> when Richard passed away, they, they cremated him and put his ashes in a motorcycle gas tank. <laughs> it was, and that thing, that thing was so heavy I couldn't pick it up. I thought... It's going to have to fuel something. Come on up here. Get on up here. Come on. Come on up close. Can I give some testimony yeah. about Deborah? Uh, I was telling her when I was hugging her. I mean, y'all just don't know what a strength Deborah and Richard were to church on the word. Deborah would come. She worked out in Atlanta, and she would rush in on Wednesday nights, and she's faithful. I know she would be hungry, and she was faithful to praise and worship practice. She was on our praise team for how many years? About six, and seven just, years. And I know she, she would get up and then give, go back to work the next day. We had a dinners. If we had dinners, they would cook. They would stand down there and serve everybody. I mean, they were a supporting joint. When I came under Church attack, Richard would be the first to defend me. Yes. He'd stand in front of me. He wouldn't let anything attack me. Amen. There are a lot of reasons why Church on the Word is still here. Faithful tithers, faithful givers. Just, just wonderful. Y'all okay. come on up closer. Come on, Tony. Come up here around her. Y'all come on up. <clears throat> You told me that. You told me what you said to her. He's going to be our new biker. Okay. That's a big one. This is the bear. Yeah, yeah. That's a sweet girl. Sweet girl. All right. Yeah, there's it. Sit. We all been personal friends. Yeah, Richard and I have been to, we're personal friends for a long time. And when we started up the bike group, I led it for seven years and got it all started. And it was time for me to step down and go somewhere else. So we prayed about it and got it handed off to Richard and Deborah. They were our car riders. You know, when you're leader of the pack, you gotta have people behind you in trailers in case a bike goes down and we have to haul it in. So they were always riding the cars and they always wanted a bike. And I'm always buying and selling things and I'd come across deals of motorcycles and everything. And Richard and Deborah happened to see one at my house one day that I had just bought from a pastor down in Noonan. I didn't have no need for it, but it was a reason I bought it was for them. Mm -hmm. And they drove it for a long time and then sold it to Tim, mm -hmm. who has it today. But in the meantime, things with my wife happened. I couldn't have a bike anymore, so I was without a bike for, for a long time. And Danny Gilstrap, Joni's husband. Joni, get up here. Had a Kawasaki 1200. And he wanted to sell it. Richard bought it. And the week he bought it, he, we were invited over to their house for dinner on Saturday. And he took me downstairs to the garage. He said, look what I bought. I said, oh, yeah, that's Danny, that was Danny Gilstrap's bike, yeah. He said, it's yeah. not your, it's not it's mine anymore, right it's yours. Yeah, I'm right there. I said, no, yeah. no, no. Right he said, no, it's my bike, but here's the title to it, and you drive it until you get one. Wow. I drove that thing for two and a half years <laughs> and told Richard, the day I took it back to him, I said, Ben, if I don't give your bike back to you, I'll never buy one myself again. <laughs> For two and a half years, I rode that bike in honor and dignity, yeah. leading the pack. Kawasaki yeah. 1200 Voyager 12. Yeah. I got rid of it and bought my own bike. He and Deborah put a track system on that bike, and they rode it until the day he passed away. Okay?
All right. That's how much this group means to them. all these people up here have had motorcycles in the past. We rode in the group, started out back, and we were called Barat Bikers. And Barat was a Hebrew name for being blessed. Yeah. So everybody that was in the group was blessed. Yeah. Then we changed the name to the Thunderbolts. And that come, come natural for us. Because we come in riding motorcycles and we go out like thunder. Yep. Whether it was Kawasaki's, Honda, Suzuki's, Harley Davidson. Yeah. It didn't matter. If you knew God and you loved God and you wanted to ride a two wheeler or three wheeler or four, yeah. whatever the case might be, yeah. come be a part of it. That's all we ask. If you love God, it's a great organization. He wants to start it back yeah. up. I'm sure he's going to look at me to get it started back up. There's two, there's two things today. This is uh, the word of the Lord to you is this is a memorial service yes. for for Richard Stack. That's what this is. Okay. Now we had a, we had an official memorial service. We've got a memorial service now going on here from Church on the Word. This is he's still with us in spirit, and uh, he's fine. We're gonna let him go. Him and Butcher eating something. I'm sure right now. Now that's right. one thing about Richard Stack. He could cook. And men, we'd have men outings on weekends, Friday and Saturday nights. And between Butch, his brother, and Richard, my friend, they would put out a feast and food that was just unbelievable. The taste was out of this world. Hmm. And it didn't make you want more and more. So anytime we had cookouts here, Richard and Butch were the cookers. But that's the way Richard was, his love for people. He gave, he gave, and gave. He gave to the last time. And he come in and gave up and gone. Yeah. He's not, he might be gone, but he's not forgotten. No. That's for sure. That's for sure. He's put an impact on all of us today. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yes, he's he's fine. He's good. Anything else you want to say, Jenny Lynn, before we? Because I'm about to give birth to this group here in just a minute in prayer. Go ahead. I just knew that if you, if you got invited to Richard and Deborah's go, because it was good food and lots of it, and you'd sit around their table and eat and enjoy yourself, and just, it just they kept bringing it out, and we had a ball. Richard was a New York, a Catholic New York Yankee, and cook. that 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 laughed about our southern hospitality all the time. Go ahead. I just know when we started the bike group, it was Greg and I and Richard and Deborah, and we would organize and we would ride our bike. They would go in their car. And we'd go on weekend trips, and it would just be us for a while. And then people would start falling in. And I think we got up to like 17 or 18 bikes and yeah. three or four cars. And we would ride every once a month, every, you know, the Sunday once a month. And we would go out to eat. We would ride, go eat, ride, and come back. So if you got to sit at the table with Richard and Deborah, you knew not to order because Deborah ordered everything on the menu and didn't eat it. So you just waited for them to order if you got to sit at their table. You just ate their food. All right. All right, well, we've been trying to give birth to a group in the spirit. I can feel it for quite a while. Harold and I got started, uh, Harold Lewis and I started last year in it. We kind of got it half started. It really wants to bud and, and, and go, but it, 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 it lacked its heart. And uh, so we're going to give birth to it. This new group will be, the vision of it is classic cars, bikes, trikes, or whatever you can drive that's legal. It don't have to be nice. It can be a rat rod. It can be anything, as long as it starts, stops, and is safe. And it'll be named Blue Collar Cruisers. That is the name of this group. And it doesn't, we're not talking about the vehicle you're riding, we're talking about the person. You are officially today a blue collar cruiser. Y'all give this girl a hand. You good. All right, I love y'all. Y'all be seated. We'll have an organizational meeting coming up here shortly, and we'll, uh, we'll get this thing back on the road. Let me help her with her jewelry. We're probably going to have to. All right, Mr. Alexander.
Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to get through this real quick this morning so we have time for everything else for the service. Uh, first off, Worldwise Bible College is every Sunday and Monday from 6 to 8, so that's tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, Wednesday nights, we're all still very busy uh, getting ready for Christmas programs and plays and dance team and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have dinner from 6 to 7, and then we have uh, all the activities and services and everything from 7 to 8. So that's every Wednesday night. The dinner is free, and uh, we'd love to see you here Wednesday between 6 and 8. Sunday, November 17th at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., we're having a special service with worship leader Janet Inman. And uh, that service will go on until Monday night, the 18th, also at 6 o'clock. So go ahead and mark your calendars. Sunday, November 17th, Monday, no November 18th, special services here with Janet Inman at Church on the Word. Also, the adult Christmas party is Sunday, December 8th. We have flyers in the back with all the information on it. Uh, uh, of course you want to attend because it's the adult Christmas party. Uh, uh, for everyone that uh, is attending, please purchase a ticket. See Miss Nyla Moses. She can help you. And uh, that is all getting started. Christmas is right around the corner. Can you believe it? Welcome to November. We're at the end of 2019 already. Crazy. And then um, our adult Sunday school class is every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We are going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. If you need a cash envelope, please raise your hand. These gentlemen are coming forward, and they can serve you. I don't have anything special this week about tithes and offerings other than, than I'm blessed. And Church on the Word is blessed. Our pastors are blessed. Everybody on the platform that I see or get to lead or have any type of interaction with at the church, they're all blessed. It's just a bunch of blessed people here. Amen. And uh, remember, the scripture says that, that the you know, the Spirit of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. And just, again, I'm just reminded every day, because I, I work in finance, and I see people's financial situations, and I see so many people that have what would be classified as, you know, they, they've made it, right? Good income, good salary, uh, money in the bank, all that kind of stuff. But y'all, there is no peace in their life whatsoever. And, and you can just tell, I mean, I can hear him and her arguing over the phone when I'm talking to them about every decision they make. I mean, it's just miserable. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, it, you would look at it from the outside looking in. You could look at a loan application or a piece of paper and thought, wow, those people are blessed. I assure you, there's no blessing there. Then I do loan applications for other people and really not a lot of money and trying to figure out how to make it work and just trying to figure out if they can buy a house or if they'll ever be able to buy a house. But you know what? They're sweet and they're friendly, and they're pleasant, and they're just a pleasure to be around. And um, which one would you rather be? Make sense? Because understand that, that God, money, if you could understand just how small a thing money is, it's very important, but it's just such a small thing. Your financial situation can be totally different from when you walk out those doors versus when you walked in. That's how quick that can turn around. But that internal peace, relationships with children, relationships with family, relationships with your spouse, that is so critical and so important. And my prayer for Church on the Word is that every blessing you have comes with no sorrow with it. Amen. Let's all lift our hands. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We receive your blessings this morning. We give excitingly, we give expectantly, and we give abundantly, sir. But we thank you for blessing us and adding no sorrow with it, that we can walk in thrilled, that we can walk out thrilled, that we can be enthusiastic to give, that we can be enthusiastic with everything we do because of the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. So we worship you this morning, sir. We worship you with our tithes and offerings, and we thank you for this time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Gentlemen, you can serve the people.
Marie's watching. She just sent us a text. She said, Thank God for the internet. She's going to be back in good shape. Mm. <laughs> Marie, it's just Marie Phillips text. Everybody wave and say hey to Marie. Hey, Marie, hey, Marie baby. Hey, baby. And Lance, can we have this microphone too? Got a quick announcement, kind of quick presentation here before we uh, break for Kids on the Word and for Youth. Um, y'all remember what, several weeks ago, a couple months ago actually, we, we started a youth competition and it's, uh, it wasn't bribery, it was encouragement. We wanted to encourage the youth group to, uh, to engage and participate and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to take it over. So there were only three regular youth members who did not have their name in the bucket um, at all. So remember, and you got your name put in the bucket for being disruptive or on your phone or all those kinds of things in youth group. And unfortunately, we do have some names in here. But there's yeah. some people who did not end up in the bucket at all. Yep. So our three, if you'll come up here and grab your cash, we've got Sonny Rodriguez. Come on, Sonny. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Way to go, man. Jackson Rodriguez. Way to go, bud. There's your cash. And Jack Alexander. These kids knew their memory verse each time they were required and they obeyed and listened and were not disruptive in class. Now, for the barf. The winner of our barf bucket, the one that gets to eat the nasty stuff. This will all happen downstairs, by the way. Yeah, it's going to take place downstairs. And we have normal snow cones for the youth group today as well. All right, here we go. Drum roll, please. Oh, my gosh, this is hilarious. <laughs> Philip Burge. <laughs> What happened, Philip? Seriously? All right, do we draw two? All right, we're going to draw one more. <laughs> Stress levels just went up. Uh oh. Wah, wah, wah. Amelia. Oh. Philip Burge and Amelia. All right. All right. Kids on the word and youth can be dismissed at this time. Yeah, the, the background story there is Kelsey put Philip's name in the bucket because he was being disruptive at youth group. <laughs> well little unusual service, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. Now, that was spoken by a patriarch of the faith. Unusual is normal here. That is a seal of approval. And that's a man that's been in some services in his day. And he's got a lot of services yet to do. Well, I'm glad I'm in this service with you today. It's an honor to be here. Everybody bring a Bible? Let me see your Bible. Hold it up. Take a look. Say, Pastor. Say it, Pastor. Here's my Bible. If you teach it, I'll have, ears to hear. I'll have ears to hear. I'll read, I'll read. and hear the word of the Lord this morning. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take a Bible, please, and turn to the book of Jude. Jude. Go to the book of Revelation, back up a little bit. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for the written word. The Bible says in uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 13, that you ought to examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. It's exam time at Church on the Word. It's time to make an examination of our heart, of our thinking, an examination of our inner man. Exam time. Thank God that it's not an exam you've got to cram for. You, and sometimes you just need to make a little adjustment, make sure that you're staying right in the faith. Somebody say amen to me right there. All right, now, Jude chapter 3, chapter, chapter 1, the only, only chapter in Jude, verse 3. <laughs> Jude, first of all, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Jude and James were brothers. The same James that wrote the book of James Brother to Jude. They were half brothers of Jesus. They all shared the same mama. I'll never forget that Wednesday night I was teaching about how Jesus had brothers and, had a, and his sisters. And I'll never forget. There was one that spoke up and said, Jesus had brothers? Who was the oldest? <laughs> I looked at her and I said, well, his mama was a virgin. I reckon Jesus was the oldest. <laughs> yeah, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Two of them are here. Jude, servant of Jesus Christ and brother to James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy to you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Sounds to me like your faith will be challenged, won't it? If you have to contend for it. And he tells you how your faith can be challenged. He says right here in verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You have to watch for creeps. There are men that will creep in unawares. Creep in to challenge your faith and ultimately neutralize the faith that you have in you and that's been my job. You know, I know during the night as I was praying, the Lord reminded me again of what my, he sometimes has to underscore what my responsibilities are as the pastor. He said, now, I know you watch. He said that to me. I know you watch. And I got to thinking about it. He knows I watch. I keep watch over my flock by night like the shepherds did in the Christmas story. Things tend to go bump in the night, don't they? So I watch in the night. Sometimes I'll get calls in the night when things go bump in the night. And I listen and I watch. I watch when you don't know I'm watching, observing. And I watch for physical issues and financial issues and watch for family squabbles and play referee from time to time and all that's fine. That's all part of the shepherding experience. But the number one thing I do, and I'll do it, and I'm never satisfied with the way I handle it because I usually get snappy. It's when somebody comes in to violate your faith because the Bible says we all have like precious faith. Precious means expensive, valuable, costly. Blood was shed to give you your faith. 
A visit to hell took place and a resurrection from the dead had to take place to give you your faith. And your faith is necessary for your salvation, necessary for your healing, necessary to keep your needs met in the earth, necessary for your children, necessary for your life. And I don't tolerate for five seconds somebody that would come in and try to violate your faith and try to take it from you. And there are men ordained from old ungodly men, creeps that will come in to try to take your faith from you. Now, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. What, what do you mean? How would somebody take my faith from me? I can't take my faith from me. Very simple. I'll outline it for you and show you how it happens, show you how they neutralize your faith. And you can decide whether you're one of the creeps. That didn't go over, Mama. I got to decide whether or not, see, he didn't let me pastor. I, you know, I knew I was called to it, but he never did, um, it, nothing ever worked out. I never did, a, never had an anointing to step over. And, I, and for years, I just finally just quit even attempting it. But I had the whole syllabus down for Church on the Word. He gave, outlined it for me. And I had it all in, in a file and put it away and forgot about it, forgot it existed, forgot I even wrote it out, forgot I even had the plan, forgot I even had the dream of it, forgot the name, Church on the Word. I'm talking about the vision died in me completely. It wasn't until Sheila Hannah came to church with Jim, I had known her since 1989, and she mentioned that we had Bible studies in my house, and for the life of me, I don't remember one of them. Did we? If it were not for the fact that I know the integrity of the woman's heart, I would think she's lying. <laughs> that vision died unto even the remembrance of it. And when the day came, I'll never forget, it was in December of 93 when he dropped Galatians 5 down in my heart and that was the final foundation stone that had to be installed before I could pastor I was teaching in Bible colleges. I was already, you know. <clears throat> but he wouldn't let me shepherd until I had the revelation of righteousness by faith solid in me. Then it was time to go. He let me get on through Christmas, get through the new year, establish my year, and in March 1994, from the seventh chapter of the book of Luke, this 14th verse, he spoke to me right over here on Thornton Road, just so clear, like a full revelation came out of that one verse of Scripture. Very simple. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. <laughs> I knew right then, I thought, uh, okay, got it. Got to know what to do. I knew what. I knew who. I didn't know much about how, and I didn't know where. But I knew who, and I knew what, so that was enough. So I... Went around looking for uh, places to start a church. I started telling people I got to start a church. I've, I've got people. I was making, I was returning 20 phone calls a night. Back in those days, we didn't have cell phones. You had to have a phone hooked to your wall. It had a cord on it. Remember those days? Some of you young ones don't know. Well, we used to be on the phone. It had a tethered. And I remember we had a little shorty wire. You know, if you twist it too much, it would all knot up. Remember, you have to unplug it and un unravel it and plug it back in. One Christmas, I got given a 20-foot cord for my telephone. It was a cordless telephone. It was, it was like I was free. I could walk out onto the carport and have a private conversation for the first time. And I would return, on average, 20 phone calls a night for 10 years, from 1984 to 1994. And when I started the church, the phone calls quit. That's just like I'd cut them off. Because... I was shepherding people, but not. There's something about the psychology of having a specific place and a church to settle the hearts of the people. Now, I still shepherded people, and they didn't go to church anywhere. And most of them would say, If you ever start a church, I'll go to your church, but I'm not going to the one I was raised in. Well, two of them did. You know, they, the rest of them stayed home from the church that I started. 
But what he had to install in me before I could pastor was an understanding of righteousness by faith that is the only understanding left inside me that needed installed so that I could understand and teach faith in a way that people, their faith would function. What good is faith prayer that don't get answered? What good is making a command of faith that doesn't take place? doesn't happen. What good is faith that doesn't serve you? Your faith is supposed to be your servant. And faith would function sporadically and periodically with me. But man, once I got that dropped in me out of Galatians chapter 5, it, I felt it. I felt it when solidified in me. And I settled. And I'll give you that revelation here in just a minute. We got about 20 minutes to give you oh, 2,000 years of revelation. Here we go. We talked about last week how that Romans, in Romans chapter 4, faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. And do you remember what we said about it? Did God give account Abraham's faith to him for righteousness when he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? When was it? Huh? Before he was circumcised, God gave him righteousness. It, it, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness before he was circumcised. Then he received circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had being uncircumcised so that he might be the father of all the uncircumcised as well as the circumcised. See how it worked? It's the faith that installed the righteousness, not the circumcision. That's what I'm telling you. Now, Hebrews chapter 4. Now go to uh, go to First Timothy. Where is First Timothy? Oh, here it is. First Timothy chapter one. Now nah, go to Hebrews 4. <laughs> Y'all be patient with me. That just came in too clear. Go back to 1 Timothy. <laughs> I, I didn't want to believe that that's where he sent me, but... <clears throat> Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. First Timothy chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now you see how quick he had to tell Timothy that? He, right out of the chute, first line in the letter, he had to address this right then. Charge some that they teach no other doctrine. There's always somebody going to show up try to teach you a doctrine that's separate from the gospel. And take your purity of your faith away from you. Most of them don't even know what they're talking about. Brother Pruitt, I'm glad you're here this morning because you can, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you deference this morning that if anything I teach this morning is not correct, you have the right to stand up and dispute me before this congregation. And correct me. 
He told Timothy, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying in faith so do. See, people give over to fables. Go to t- using a pulpit to Sunday school classes, go to talk in faith. You know what a fable is? It's a made-up story to try to teach truth. Since when do we need something false to teach something that's true? Made up stories, myths. We, we learned Greek mythology in some, my sophomore year in high school. I don't need an untruth to verify the truth. Don't give heed to fables, fictitious stories, and even endless genealogies. Now, I believe if you want to go check out your family history and go to genealogy.com, that's fine. But listen, just because there was some duke in your ancestry don't make you special. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. These things minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do Now, the end of the commandment, now the commandment meaning... All of God's word was known as the commandment. It was all called the commandment originally. The end of the commandment is charity, love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned, faith that's not fake. Remember when I taught a lesson a few months ago called Faith or Fake? Remember that one? Go back on YouTube and look it up. Look up Faith or Fake. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. You know what vain jangling is? You can look it up as a discordant sound like the ringing of a cymbal. Just a bunch of noise. Vain jangling. I've heard preaching. I've preached vain jangling. (laughs) Desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now, we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. <clears throat> knowing this, knowing this, say, Pastor, I'm going to know this. Say it. <laughs> knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Did you know it's not? The law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, was not made for righteous people. It's not made for a righteous man now. But it was made for the lawless, the disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy, for profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers and whoremongers and them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers and liars and for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing contrary to sound doctrine... Now, see, and if I go to preaching law at you, guess what I think of you? Wow. Say, Pastor, that ain't me. <clears throat> Jesus has done a better work in me than that. <laughs> he said, these guys desire to be teachers of the law because the law can make you seem like, teaching the law can make you seem like you really know your stuff. But the law was installed because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now I'm going to read that scripture to you here in just a minute. Look up here at me. Y'all listen to me. Listen to me. I'm your pastor, okay? I want your faith functioning right. I want you, when you pray, you get answers. And I mean, he'll do it for you quickly. He's ever ready to listen to you. Pray and pray in faith and then he'll answer. And that kind of relationship with him and fellowship with him comes out of a pure faith. My job is to go in and find out who's throwing dirt in your faith, dig it out, and keep your faith pure. So we're going to do that right here. Unto Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He said not to seeds as of many. 
but as of one, which is Christ. To Abraham and to Christ was the promises made. The law entered that because of transgressions. The law entered not to try to curb sin, because the law couldn't curb sin. The law brought revival to sin. The Bible says this. He said, I, he said, I was alive. Paul said, I was alive without sin once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And that which was supposed to be made holy to me, I found it to be unto death. So is the law ungodly? He said, God forbid the law. We know the law is perfect and holy and just and good. But I'm carnal, sold under sin. What he's saying was that the, the promise came to Abraham and to Jesus, his seed. Until Jesus could get here, the law had to be installed, put a big electron microscope over the sin so people would be convinced that they need help beyond the law. I got to have some help. I, I messed up and I, I can't be fixed. Then the law was the precursor to bring them in. The Bible says a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith and not by the works of the law. Now when these creeps come in here, and they will. I had a cartoon caricature come up recently. Creep. He looked like a cartoon. God love him. Branded with the evidence of his rebellion in his ungodly years. Now he swapped one rebellion. He rebelled against parents, rebelled against authority back then. Now he's saved. Now he's trying to rebel against everybody that's in church. He, he's he's going to make it though. I got faith. I, I, really, I really like him. I do. I think he's gifted. Needs his jaw slapped and needs his, needs his spank, fanny spanked and you know, he's going to be all right. But he's a creep. All creeps have one thing in common. And that is to come in and tell you how you haven't added something, you have subtracted something from the equation that keeps the people from being saved. And when you do this, you'll be right. Of course, I've got the answer and you don't. So here, shut up, sit down, and listen to me. That's a creep. Let me ask you something. He may be watching. I doubt it, but he may be. Let me ask you something. What addendum can you install that will benefit the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> to what can you add? Well, you got to get them to hold their mouth right, Pastor, and you make sure that when you baptize them, their head and their feet are under at the same time. You make sure you hold them under until bubbles show up and then, then raise, raise them from the dead. Make sure you do it in the name of Jesus only and then tell them no smoking after that. And if you smoke, immediately you go right back to hell. If you don't. Or name any other thing you could add to it. As if the, you would think the way these creeps preach that the blood of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead is the weakest thing that has ever been preached in the earth. It's so volatile. It's so easily... Suddenly the, the rug's jerked out from under you and you're plummeting down into the depths of hell again because you went to bed too late last night or something. <laughs> or you ate pork. <laughs> or you put something else in your mouth. As if suddenly now what Jesus was saying was a lie when He said... That which enters into a man's mouth does not defile him, but that which comes out. Well, you know, Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, I know for good and well there's some things you can stick in your mouth. Look, I'm not saying go smoke and drink anything you want to drink, eat whatever you want to eat. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying let's keep our faith pure. And watch out for these creeps. If anybody puts something on you that is not good news, it is not the gospel. If anybody puts any kind of action on you that you must perform before you can be made right with God, it is not the gospel. He did not come to me 
and ask me to perform some dance for him to be right. He went to a cross. All of my wrongs were put on him. All of my sicknesses were attached to him. And he became the chalice filled with sin and sickness and demons and fear. The Bible says he was. The Bible says as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness as Moses did so, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He became the sign. Jesus didn't just take on sin. Jesus became sin in the flesh and was still alive in that body. He stood there and waited for every man's sin that would ever sin in the earth to be attached to him. And he waited. Wouldn't it have been something to think the last five minutes of his time on the cross before he died, he was taking on the sins of the people that would ever attend church on the Word? I'm glad he waited. I'm glad he didn't wait for just three-fourths of the sins of men. Or the sicknesses and diseases. Thank you, ma'am. Help me preach it. Or the sicknesses, or the diseases, or the demons, or the fear. No, he took them all and became sin, sickness, demons, and fear on the cross. He did. And then he cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost and put, was put to death. He obeyed death, and in so doing, he put to death the sin and the sickness and the demons and the fear. That's what the story of the gospel is about, son. Right there. And because he had never sinned, God could legally raise him from the dead after three days and three nights. He suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. He suffered the vengeance of the high court of eternal justice was finally satisfied. God said, that's enough. Raise him up. Get up. Let all the angels of God worship him. And with that, he began to raise from the dead. To that, I have nothing to add. God, I know you raised Jesus from the dead, but don't you need me to knock on a few doors before I can be saved? <laughs> God, oh, wait a minute. God, I know you raised Jesus from the dead and all that, and I believe all that, but... Isn't there a goal for me to cook 450 pounds of potato salad in my lifetime before I can be worthy of the kingdom? I know it seems silly to say, but you'd be surprised at the works that people feel like they have to perform before they can be awarded the very righteousness that the resurrection brought you. An addendum. Something added. You don't have to add nothing. Pastor, if you preach this, people are just going to be lazy, never go to church, never do nothing. They might. They might. Yes, and I have suffered. Oh, honey, if I had just put you under a little bit of works and a little bit of doctrine of effort and performance and all that, man, we'd have been done bought us a big old building by now. It's the truth. Some people are comfortable with a whole lot of what you got to do. Tell me what I got to do, Pastor, because I, I, I don't know if I can trust myself with this faith thing alone. But you know, if you're going to do something, you're going to trust what you do, your faith won't function. You're going to be trusting you. Say it. I don't trust. I do. I, don't trust I trust he did. I trust he did. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to purify our faith and we're going to go home. Where do I go, Lord? Oh, yeah. Put up Habakkuk 2.4 on the, on the screen behind me. See, you can be saved by faith. That's one thing. Just simply call on the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10 says, What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and and believe that God, call on the name of the Lord Jesus, believe that God has raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. Because with the, the mouth, confession is made unto salvation once the heart believes unto righteousness. Now that's what it takes to be saved. Who in here has called on the name of the Lord? Thank you. Yes. Amen. 
Say it. Do this then. If you hadn't, just say, Jesus, Jesus. I call on your name. name. The Bible says you're saved. Now, wait a minute now. Pastor, Pastor, aren't you supposed to baptize them and aren't you supposed to put them under water and aren't you supposed to tell them to live right, live straight and don't mess up and don't go and go back and go back to prayer time and see if you can clean up all that their father, their grandfather and their great grandfather and their great great grandfather and their great 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 grandfather all the way back to Adam. Go back and cleanse their bloodline so you can be straight. I, oh, that's a doctrine that's going around. Uh, it's got a little truth to it. But you know what? It'd take me a lifetime to cleanse what my dad did. <laughs> and the stories I heard of my grandpa, pretty good. Stories of my great-grandpa, oh my God. Alexander. Did you know... The Bible says that there's coming a day when it's not going to be said, the proverb is not going to be said that because the fathers ate a sour grape, the children's teeth are set on edge. Am I right, Lane Whitfield? That proverb is not going to be said anymore. No. My teeth are not on edge because my father ate a sour grape. I tell you what, I'm preaching the gospel to you today. Look at that one right there. Habakkuk chapter 2. Behold, his soul is lifted up in him. That's not upright. But the just will live by faith. Listen, when you go to thinking you got to do something to, you actually think you can do something to gain the throne of God. (laughs) How uplifted does your soul have to be inside you to think you can actually do something? To attain to the throne. Are you hearing the gravity by which the Spirit is speaking to you this morning? Now look at Romans chapter 1, 6, 17. Say, the just shall live by faith, Pastor. Now chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. <laughs> Pastor... What's wrong with me trying to do something right? Not a thing wrong with you trying to do something right. But if you trust your ability to do something right over the blood of Jesus, your faith won't function. And I'm not going to let no creep come in here and tell you you ain't doing it right. Because it ain't up to you to do right. It's up to him to do right and give you his faith. And that's what will lead you to do right. Here we go. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Next verse. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. And he's about to quote Habakkuk 2. The just shall live by faith. Yes. Now go to Galatians chapter 3. We've got five minutes. Y'all listen fast. Galatians chapter 3. If you'll hear this, you'll hear me now. Get rid of the impurities inside you. Just adjust your heart. You trust Jesus only. Nobody else. Your prayers will get answered quick. Quick, just like that. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know you therefore that they which are of faith... The same are the children of Abraham. Are you of faith? If you believe in Jesus, you are the child of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Did you know that Abraham received the gospel preached to him? He was preached the resurrection of the dead. He was preached, God preached to Abraham that there would be a son that would die and raise from the dead. And that is why he thought that his son Isaac was going to be the one. He took him up that mountain. Was it Mount Moriah? He claved the wood. I was splitting wood the other day. First splitter leaked oil. The next splitter carburetor went out. I went and rented one at Home Depot. Son, that one finally, it quit one time. Yes. 
I finally got it going. I was splitting wood and thought how heavy it was. Big logs, about this two feet around and two feet tall. I'm rolling them up to the splitter, splitting and moving this one over and fall on your foot and hurt your toe and get splinters and kept splitting that wood. And I got to thinking about how Abraham took off up to Mount Moriah with his son. And it says he claved the wood for the sacrifice. He had an axe and he's splitting the wood. What does that tell me about Abraham? It's not the first thing it tells me. It's not the first thing it tells me. It tells me that he went to the effort to split that wood. He knew he was going to build a fire. He believed he's going to put his son on that. Take thy son, thy only son, and offer him. He went up there to, he thought he'd get this thing on the road. Because the Bible says that he knew he'd come on the top of splitting that wood. That's hard work. He built that big altar. And his son said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? You know what Abraham said to him? He said, God provide, son. Split that wood. Yes, sir. He's fixed to bind his son up and put him on there. Kill him. Sacrifice him. Because the Bible says that God, that God had told him about the gospel. The, he preached this gospel to him. And he, God, he said that Abraham believed that God was able to raise up his son Isaac even from the dead. From whence he had received him raised from the dead in a figure. He saw in a vision what, Abraham, what the son of God would be raised from the dead. And he thought and was fully convinced that Isaac was the Messiah. That's why he was ready to get this thing on the road. But you know why God didn't let him raise Isaac, kill Isaac? He was putting pressure on himself. If, if my covenant partner is ready to sacrifice his son, I'm painted in the corner now. I've got to sacrifice mine. That's what that was about. Hold it. Coming down with a knife. Stop. Got that angel stop him. He looked and there was a ram with his horns all in a thicket trying to get out. Had him hung. He said, there's your sacrifice right there. He sacrificed him. And came down with his son. Built an altar there. He is Jehovah Jireh. The God that provides. He believed God unto get ready to stab his son. We think we believe God. It says here. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached the gospel unto Abraham saying and you shall all nations be blessed. So then, thank God I'm a child of Abraham. Amen. They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law hold your mouth right, do this right, do that, pull that lever, push that button, do this right, you got to do this right, you got to do all that right are cursed. <clears throat> For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But it, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. For it is evident, the just shall live by faith. <sighs> Look at the next first, next first few words of chapter, or verse 12. And say this with me. And the law is not of faith. Say it. The law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. Boy, I'm going to get some ugly letters, ugly emails, and I might even have somebody come in here and call, call us a cult because law keepers believe that if you keep the law, you look good and everybody else looks bad, and I keep the law better than you do. I even had a pastor cross the table at me at a Mexican restaurant. Yes, sir, you know how there's a psychological line right there on the table that you, this is where your plate goes and that's where his plate goes? And all I said, all I did, all I said, I just quoted a scripture. I just quoted James 2.10. If you do the whole law perfectly and offend in one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. And you can judge people about sin, hell, sex, hate, and homosexuality, but you tell a white lie, you're going to be judged the same as if you did that too. He said, I don't believe that. He come over the table at me. I said, well, you don't have to believe it. It's true. That just means you don't believe something that's true. Why am I preaching all this? Once in a while it hits me, why am I doing all this? Why am I talking like this? Thank you for joining us for the WordWise Christian broadcast here at Church on the Word. Remember, 
God gave us His written Word to get our thinking straightened out. That's why we have a Bible college tonight at 6 o'clock until 8 o'clock. Also tomorrow night. You might want to come and attend. Don't come with your agenda. Get your head bit off. When His mindset becomes our own, faith is always the result. Peace comes. Our believing gets straightened out. Our confession gets straightened out because our thinking got straightened out. Because we've become... Word wise. God bless you. Yes. See you next week. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached on the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Grab that microphone and pray us out of here. You sure can. Hand her a microphone first, then you can pray us out, and I'm going to calm um, down. About four weeks ago, we were you with me? We were talking to a lady, and um, they were raised in just one of your basic denominations, and her sister, I'm talking about a very intelligent person, a lawyer in New York, in uh, Washington, D.C. She works for the NRA. And uh, But she decided that she, she couldn't measure her Christianity good enough with her basic uh, denomination and went to this huge, you'd know the, dom, the this huge denomination paid a ton of money to become one of these people. But, and then they put a lot of requirements on you. I said, why would your sister do that? Why would she? She said, because she's one, she has to measure herself. She wants to measure and see how, it's, it's the religion you were right, you were brought out of. She wanted to get right back in that. Yeah, I mean, like I, I've said, really? Like she said, yes. Yeah, she has to have things to do to prove to her that she is a Christian. And you know, I'm just telling you that what he's preaching, it, people are really living it. They're doing. I mean, she paid thousands of dollars to get in this bondage, thousands. Well, I love Church on the Word, don't y'all? I feel like we've had about three services this morning packed into one. Amen. Y'all stand. Lord, we thank you for Church on the Word. We thank you for the service this morning. Uh, we thank you for the message that came from this pulpit this morning. Uh, I speak a blessing over this congregation. I say everything that we touch this week will be successful and profitable. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength.